Scott Weeders. Uh, estudio en uh, Universidad de Texas, de San Antonio. So, mi español es muy malo. Lo siento. So, I will speak in English. Uh, I am an emergency physician, and I practice with Dr. Roliga Sanchez in Temple, Texas, and I serve as the, the campus dean for our medical school, so medical education is close to my heart. Um, I'm thankful today for my boss, Dr. Roliga, to, to allow me to come on this vacation with him and trip. I will say that he makes grand entrances, and I don't know if he did this earlier this morning, but the man is a cowboy. Cannot tell you. And so thank you. Also, uh, Dr. Dominguez, thank you for the opportunity to speak. We have a saying in Texas that when someone does a job well and they're a good leader, they have taken the bull by the horns. And so I, I present you with this gift, a bullhorn mug. So thank you, sir. We all see bleeding patients. And when you see someone bleeding, are you going to stand there and do something or just stand there and bleed? And that is the challenge that I give to you today. I'm going to be talking about the bleeding patient on the direct inhibitors, new oral anticoagulants. I will not be speaking about Coumadin, but I'll talk about the 10A and the direct thrombin inhibitors. I, I have no disclosures. I show you everything. You may reach me at my email. I also tweet at Free Open Access Medical Education at EMED Coach. Twitter people, any Twitter people? Yes, I'm looking to make some new friends this weekend. My story starts with two of my best friend's parents. This is Gary and Kay. Gary's a retired preacher. He's a cowboy. He lives a few miles south of us, and this is his horse, Coco. About eight years ago, Gary was out riding in his field with a friend, and Coco got spooked. The horse bucked, and Gary was thrown. He hit his head. He landed hard. But he's a cowboy. He's a preacher. He humbly walked to our emergency department and found out we have a, a four-hour wait. He told the nurse his pain was low, a level two, because he's a cowboy. So he sat down. He waited. And after four hours of waiting in our waiting room, he finally came back. And Gary was not doing well. He gave me permission to talk about his case, but he had a flail chest, hemothorax. He had a subdural hematoma. He was not doing very well. And as you can guess from the point of my talk, he was taking anticoagulation. So how do we care for Gary? in his worst day. How are we to help him? I want to talk about the 10A inhibitors as well as the direct thrombin inhibitors, Dabigatran, and how we can help patients out. I think if we want to do justice to our patients, we should hire Lawrence Fishburne to counsel them. Which anticoagulation would you like to take? These are very difficult decisions. These medicines are complex, they have complications, and they're not to be taken lightly. The first thing I would ask you to consider is which medication someone is taking and two specific aspects of their medication profiles. How long will these medicines last? When did you last take them? I don't know about Mexico, but Americans, they don't take their pills. So when did you last take your medicines? Also, they're very carefully renal cleared, some to some high degrees, some to low degrees. Renal failure is prominent in this patient profile, so you need to be aware of the renal profile. Again, sometimes we shouldn't prescribe these medicines. This poor lady, she doesn't want her husband to be treated for erectile dysfunction, bless their heart. So, sometimes we must say no. Measuring these are difficult. You will have better luck measuring a drug profile with a tape measure than you will with some of our lab tests. They're very difficult to tell. Is the drug active? Is it inactive? We don't know. There are a lot of different agents you might consider to look. 
I don't know if you have Ekron clotting time. We don't have that readily available. We don't have drug chromatography rapidly available in our systems. But we do have things like PTT, INR. We have TEG. I hear you have TEGs. Anti-10A levels. That might be a possibility. At our institution, if you order an anti-10A level on a patient taking rivaroxaban or any of these, you will find that it is only validated for unfractionated and low molecular weight heparin. So you must check with your lab, is this calibrated to measure the drug that I want it to measure? Lest you measure the wrong thing. We must be careful. Measuring 10As, you must calibrate. Now I've seen some experts say, well, we should measure the PT if we are worried about a 10A inhibitor. And I would say that you must raise caution before doing that. If your prothrombin time is elevated, it's very likely that that drug is contributing to coagulopathy. However, if it is normal, that only detects less than 75% of active drug. These drugs can be potent at levels of about 50%. And so because your PT is normal, you cannot rule out a 10A inhibitor contributing to coagulopathy. You must be careful. It's the same thing with our direct thrombin inhibitors. They more commonly will elevate our PTT. Okay. Again, same thing. If it's high, it's likely contributing. If it's low, we don't know. We don't know. Again, we're using the wrong test to measure this drug. Who likes TEG? Anybody like TEGs? Nobody likes TEGs? We have a few TEG lovers. All right, well, okay, good. I am not a TEG expert, okay? We do run TEGs. TEGs can be important. And because I'm not a TEG expert, I have to have wine and truth, right? I don't know if you've seen this, but they can talk about drink glasses and how they look like the different thromboelastograms, okay? So here, if you like brandy, you know, maybe you're, you're normal, okay? So this might be normal. If you like cryoprecipitate, maybe you like champagne. All right, wine glasses, you might need some FFP to order it at your table. And maybe if you have low extra fibrinolysis, you might have the martini glass for TXA or the test tube needing platelets. And I'm dumb, so I need this, this helps me. So consider using wine glasses to measure your tags. I mean, my take home point is that these drugs are very difficult to measure. We do not have good tools. We can use some information, but it is not accurate. And so we're going out into the field without the right information in order to make good decisions for our patients. And also these tests can lie, like Pinocchio. Now let's talk about reversing these patients. Let's say you have a person like Gary that is bleeding to death. There is a lot of things out there that you can consider. And there, I see all of these in a lot of expert recommendations from Europe and international and American and North American, South, Asian. There's a lot of different expert recommendations, but they don't agree on how to take care of these patients. Sometimes you'll see things like charcoal. It's not gonna be helpful in a critical patient. Uh, dialysis, that takes too long. Okay. Uh, activated 7A? No, that's not going to work. FFP takes too long. FFP, you need 30 per kilo in order to get to the right INR. And the INR of FFP is 1.7. You can't get back to normal. So we have to be careful. In looking at our coagulation cascade, let's focus in on a few of our agents. First of all, we'll talk about if we're dealing with the 10A inhibitors, one good agent might be prothrombin complex concentrates. The three-factor PCC are not as effective as the four-factor PCC. Four-factor PCC directly address two, seven, nine, and 10, and that's exactly where the 10A inhibitors will be working. Now, we have to remember that PCC also contains protein C and protein S, which are mild anticoagulants, and so it's balanced. It's balanced. That's in contrast to factor eight inhibitor bypass activity, FIBA. This is high octane, activated, fully thrombotic, 
without protein C and protein S. So much more strong than PCC. FFP covers everything, okay? We've talked about that. It can cause acute lung injury, taco, trolley, all of these bad things. It's a large amount of infusion, 30 per kilo, and it's difficult to get people back to normal again. I think if you don't have any other agents, this might be your option, but it is not the best and not my high recommendation. Now we have some new, new kids on the block. These have been approved by the Federal Drug Administration by an American regulators. Not quite so in, in, in Mexico. At Nexit Alpha is a new drug that will be addressing specific 10A inhibitors. Serparentag is supposed to be the shotgun to fix everything. 10A inhibitors, direct thrombin inhibitors, heparin, low molecular weight heparin. It's supposed to be everywhere. This is not yet approved in America. It is still undergoing trials and studies, but this is the future that might help our patients. I dare use Sizumab, Praxbind. This is a direct thrombin inhibitor that is supposed to address dabigatran. And this is approved in America for use. The other thing we need to think about is plasminogen will come and it will dissolve the clot and cause fibrinolysis. And our bleeding patients are fighting between coagulation, fibrinolysis, back and forth, back and forth. And if you remember, tranexamic acid blocks this. I will be speaking more about tranexamic acid later this afternoon. This is recommended by many experts to help with our bleeding patients, especially within the first two hours when on anticoagulation. So let's say our bleeding patient is coming in and they're dancing with the devil. They're taking dabigatran. I think when you take this medicine, you're dancing with the devil. It is very far down the coagulation cascade. It's very difficult to treat. It's highly unstable with renal failure patients, and it's very difficult to reverse. Again, looking down, it's over here, far in this corner. So very far down in the coagulation cascade, close to our clots. So what do we do when we need to stop someone from blocking vomit? This was approved in the United States, 2015. And the pathway of this medicine is quite embarrassing, I will say. They got 45 guys that were minding their own business. They said, hey, do you want to take this medicine and get poisoned and then take our medicine and get reversed? Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Let's try this. So I was not part of this study. They took labs. They got better. The next level was that they found 35 patients with life-threatening bleeds. They gave this medicine to them. In four hours later, a lot of them felt better. It was not compared to placebo. It was not compared to standard therapy, not compared to FIBA, not compared to PCC. Simple case series. Very low level evidence. Very low level evidence. They also performed procedures on people that were taking dabigatran and then received this idarucizumab to reverse. And they found that most of them had normal hemostasis. Again, not compared to another group. Most of these were central lines. And then a larger study in 2017, life-threatening bleeding, patients mostly with intracranial hemorrhage, GI bleeds, taking dabigatran, were given idarucizumab, and the bleeding stopped at about two and a half hours. There was a 6% thrombosis rate, which is important. Most of the PCCs in these kind of studies had a thrombosis rate in that neighborhood, single digit, as low as three, as high as maybe six, seven. Again, they did procedures on these people, mostly central lines, minor surgeries, lumbar punctures. Most all of them had hemostasis. And again, concerning thrombosis rate. Was there a conflict of interest with these leaders? Yes, there was. More than I can fit on the slide. Many of the authors of these trials were direct employees of the companies that make these drugs. So this is, again, very low level evidence for a recommendation. Very difficult to make a recommendation based on this level of evidence. So my conclusion, when someone comes in with dabigatran and they're bleeding to death and you need to reverse them, we're using low powered studies that were sponsored by the industry 
without comparisons and very real clinical outcome norms. I'm not sure what to tell you. If I am given this, and I have had a few patients that have had bleeding, we are using idariocizumab in our hospital. We're administering five grams. If the bleeding has happened within the first two hours, we're using tranexamic acid, one gram, and we're trying to help our patients out. If you do not have access to idariocizumab, I would suggest FIBA. The reason is that FIBA is the activated form and dabigatran is so low on our coagulation cascade. Remember, it's back down here in the corner, so it's very low. So that's why we're recommending the active form of these agents. Next, let's switch gears and talk about the 10A inhibitors. I even saw a booth outside for one of the drugs. So I know these medicines are here in Mexico. People are taking them. We see a lot of these in the United States. Probably more people taking the 10A inhibitors than the direct dominant inhibitors, uh, but these are common medicines. There's a lot of data that looks at animals and healthy humans, and I won't go into the details. But what I will say is when we look at studies on patients that are taking 10A inhibitors and we give them reversal agents, we will find out that when you give PCCs, four factor, or FIBA to these patients, the labs look better. That's the summary of all of these trials. Here are some patient-centered outcomes. Mahid in 2017 looked at about 84 patients that were taking 10 inhibitors who had bleeding in their brain. These people were given prothrombin complex concentrates and again found to have hemostasis, 18% died. Thrombosis rates were about uh, you know, 5% in this rate. Again, no comparison arm, this is a case series. Another case series in 2017, 13 patients taking 10A inhibitors with intracranial hemorrhages, this time giving factor VIII inhibitor bypass activity. Varied results from these patients. I'm not sure what to do with case series. I don't know how many people use Facebook, but if you get your news from Facebook, that is not the best place. Case reports are to evidence-based medicine, as Facebook is to news. You have to be careful. All right, we're going to switch gears, and the next slides are brought to you by the official comfort pet of anticoagulated patients. This is the Chinese hamster, and the next drug I'm going to speak of came from the ovaries of Chinese hamsters, if you can believe that. But that's where they found this medicine. You've got to look deep and far to find new medicines these days, Chinese hamster ovaries. So the drug is called adnexanet, and you know that this is a 10A inhibitor, because it has the XA in its title. Now, this was approved in America on May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. They did two trials, one at Nexa A on Apixaban, the other trial at Nexa R on River Roxaban. Again, you can see the pattern. They found people minding their own business who wanted to volunteer to take these poisons and then be given new drugs that were not tested on, on animals, or tested on animals but not humans, and find out how things worked. This was the first step. These people received good results based on their lab data, and that moved into larger studies on humans that were actually bleeding. They found about 350 patients that were bleeding on 10A inhibitors. Again, no comparison arm. This is a large case series. What they found is that when patients were bleeding, they had good hemostasis, reduction of 10A inhibitor lab values. The part that I did not like is the thrombosis rate, 10% of thrombotic rates. That is very high, very high, much higher than PCCs, much higher than FIBA, and I don't like this, and this is very concerning. This drug costs 50,000 American dollars. That's 1 million pesos. Very expensive. So when you have a patient that has a life-threatening bleed and they are taking a 10A inhibitor, you might consider adnexanet for a million pesos and a 10% thrombosis rate. That's very high risk, my friends, very high risk. Or you may consider what I would say is PCCs in these patients. 
and tranexamic acid if it happened within the first two hours. So that's my summary for a patient who's bleeding on a 10A inhibitor. What is the future? There's a new drug being studied right now, serenteritag. This is a shotgun approach. It shoots all over. It binds to 10A inhibitors, binds to direct thrombin inhibitors, heparin, low molecular weight heparin. It will stop everything. It is an antibody that binds to these drugs and removes them from our circulation. This is not ready yet in American hospitals, probably not in Mexican either, but this might be something to keep an eye on for the future of anticoagulation management. Well, folks, I've given you the world's literature on dealing with anticoagulated patients bleeding to death. You are now experts, my friend. Congratulations, you are all certified experts. There's not much out there. In summary, these medicines are very hard to measure. You have to know your half-lives. You have to know your renal clearance. Common coagulation tests will lie. You must be very careful. As I was speaking with my friends, sometimes you just have to go right back and look at the patient. Assess their bleeding. Use these tools to supplement your care, but go back to the patient. If someone is bleeding from at Nexit Alpha, uh, a direct a 10A inhibitor, consider it next at alpha for high cost. Thrombosis is a concern. PCCs are probably going to be a better bet. If you have somebody with direct thrombin inhibitor, I dare use Cizumab or Fiba and using tranexamic acid. So hopefully I've given you some information to get your patients back on their horses again. And I thank you so much. You've been a very gracious and beautiful audience. I appreciate your hospitality. Have a wonderful conference.